Hi everybody, welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Terry Stiles in for Jim Hughes, only this week. Happy New Year. In this week's news, there are updates in the search for the Oxford School Superintendent. The New Year, new developments in Oxford Village Government, and in our last story, Oxford High School grads strike up the band. So stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Oxford News This Week. The search for a new Oxford Community Schools superintendent is almost underway, and the Oxford Board of Education is working alongside with Hazard, Young, Atea, and Associates to include input from several communities and dis district groups. During a special board meeting on December 18th, Associate Serena Shavers, and I hope I'm saying that right, discussed the planning documents with the board. The uh, timeline begins with school board members individually. They will uh, do interviews and then the community and district focus groups in late January and early February. The Board of Education suggests a focus group should include victims and families of the 2021 tragedy. The Board has asked for another spe specification surrounding the tragedy. The superintendent must be required to or have a willingness to complete trauma-informed training hazard. Oh, Hazard and Young, Atea and Associates will then put forth an online survey to review what characteristics members of the school and community want in their superintendent. The superintendent search firm will then conduct background checks and select between six to eight candidates to go through rounds of interviews. The choice of the new superintendent is projected to be made by April. There's a vacancy in Oxford's Beautification Commission and the Village of Oxford is looking to fill it. The Beautification Commission is a part of the Oxford Village Government, which includes the Village Council and the Downtown Development Authority, among other elected positions. The Beautification Commission consists of a chair and four other members who promote landscaping and flowering through an awards program and other activities. Members meet in the morning on the third Monday of the month as needed. The village is also looking to fill a vacancy on the planning commission for a term that goes through 2024. Typically, commissioners serve three-year terms, so this is an opportunity to dip your feet in and test the waters if it's a commissioner's position for, right for you. As a member, you will become a part of the decision-making processes processes and serve your community. If you are interested, reach out to the village administration for additional information at manager at the village of Oxford.org or you can call them by calling 248-628-2543. to do with that Christmas tree. Well, it's time to recycle nature's Christmas trees and they're both biodegradable and recyclable. After all the decorations are taken down, instead of leaving the tree by the road or garbage and the waste collection companies have to pick it up, consider recycling. Now through January 31st, Christmas trees can be dropped off at the parking lot by the farmer's market at Seymour Lake Park. Only real trees can be recycled and all ornaments, lights, ribbons, and hooks must be removed before the tree is dropped off. When it's time to say goodbye to that holiday, visit 2795 Seymour Lake Road to recycle your Christmas tree. The Oxford Downtown Authority wants to hear your feedback. In 2024, the DDA uh, said that they have big plans, but they're also looking to the community for ways to imagine bigger and better. The DDA recently released a short survey to do just that, brainstorming for the upcoming year and beyond. The DDA impacts the entire area from the Larry Obrecht Bridge, or the Pollyann Trail, 
um, that bridge that goes over M24 south to Oxford Marketplace Strip Mall. The survey is made up of six questions asking anonymous participates, participants about how frequently they visit the downtown area, how they hear about events, and the types of programming and infrastructure developments that they most want to see. To assess the survey and leave your input on the DDA visit, uh, site, visit the DDA um, Oxford DDA Facebook page. That was a mouthful. Another survey is being requested by the Township of Oxford seeking plans for the future of the community. Participants are uh, being asked to share your opinion on housing, new development, public services, and infrastructure. Paper copies of the survey are available at the Township offices on Dunlap Road, or for questions, you can contact the Planning and Zoning Department at 248-628-9787, extension 101. Euchre fanatics, get ready to unite. Oxford Township Parks and Rec Recreation is hosting a brand new Euchre tournament in 2024. On Friday, January 19th, participants will enjoy a light lunch followed by friendly tournament style euchre at the Oxford Senior Center, which is at 2795 Seymour Lake Road. Prizes will be awarded to the first, second, and third place winners, and players can come with a partner, a group of friends, or by themselves. Previous euchre experience is preferred and advanced registration is required. Please contact Oxford Township Parks and Recreation at 248-628-1720 to sign up and have fun. In Behind the Lens this week, calling all home helpers. Oxford Elementary students recently partnered with Humble Designs, a nonprofit organization that designs and fully furnishes home interiors for individual families and veterans emerging from homelessness. Since 2009, the organization has helped nearly 6,000 children end their days of sleeping on the floor and reused over 9 million pounds of donated furniture. Oxford Elementary Student Council members helped to collect donations of toys, games, and household items while fifth graders uh, delivered the donations to the Humble Designs warehouse within the help, with the help of Gardner White. The Student Council also donated the money raised from Santa Graham to Humble Designs. Oxford Elementary is continuing to fundraise and in April teachers will participate in a design day for a family. Up next, Dave Kenny will have Auto Talk and Science in the News, so don't go away. You're watching Oxford News This Week. with the nurse practitioner. Fantastic. Dad, lunch. Got some soup for you. You are loved. Oh, you. <laughs> Look at those freckles. This was very much. You fun. are valued. Yeah. <laughs> you are strong. You are resilient. You got this. You are there for them. We are here for you. Find free care guides to support you and your loved one at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from Automotive News. 
Volkswagen AG said its battery startup has seen promising results with solid state cells for electric vehicles, a win for the German car maker as it pushes to make EVs more efficient and less expensive. A solid state prototype from VW's US partner, QuantumScape Corporation, significantly exceeded industry's targets in recent tests, the car maker said January 3rd in a statement. During tests by VW's battery unit PowerCo over several months, the cell saw only 5% shortage capacity loss after more than 1,000 charging cycles, the equivalent of 310,685 miles on the road. VW said industry targets for this development phase are 700 charging cycles and a maximum loss of 20% capacity. QuantumScape wants to bring the cell to market as quickly as possible, founder and chief executive officer Jagdeep Singh said. But scaling up production of automotive grade batteries has proven tricky and has led the company to put more emphasis on batteries for consumer electronics in its investor letters. EV and battery makers are racing to commercialize New technologies including next generation anodes and sodium ion and solid state batteries to power EVs more cheaply and efficiently. Solid state batteries replace the conventional liquid electrolyte and separator both flammable with a solid separator made of ceramic glass or polymers. The innovation, if proven to work beyond the lab and reproduced flawlessly hundreds of thousands of times in a factory, could make EV batteries safer, smaller, and faster charging. The results of the test carried out at PowerCo Labs in Germany were first revealed by QuantumScape during the company's third quarter earnings call in October. The battery startup didn't mention Volkswagen and its customer and target and largest as its customer and larger shareholder during the call. In our next story, the number of electric models eligible for consumer tax credit as of as much as $7,500 fell sharply as new rules from the Biden administration kicked in on January 1st. Narrower criteria reduced the number of qualifying models to 13 from about two dozen, according to federal data from fueleconomy.gov. The new rules exclude from the tax credit vehicles that use battery components made by Chinese manufacturers. Treasury Department spokesman Ashley Shapital, Shapital that is, said the government has been closely coordinating with companies on the new restrictions, but that some companies had yet to submit data, which could lead to additions to the list. Treasury Department rules unveiled last month target battery components made by any company that is subject to Chinese jurisdiction or is at least 25% owned by the Chinese government. In 2025, the restrictions will expand to include suppliers of key raw materials for batteries such as nickel and lithium. Depending on factors such as battery component and part manufacturing location, vehicles can either qualify for a $7,500 or a $3,750 tax credit. Among the vehicles still eligible for the full or partial consumer credit are the Tesla Model Y, Rivian Automotive in Incorporated uh, R1T pickup truck, uh, Stellantis Jeep Wrangler 4XE and Ford Motor Company's F-160 Lightning pickup truck. Models that lost access to credit included Tesla's Cybertruck and, in some, ver and some versions of the Model 3, Nissan's Leaf, Ford's e-transit van and General Motors' electric Blazer and Silverado. The new requirements were included in Joe uh, Biden's signature climate law at the behest of Senator Joe Manchin, the West Virginia Democrat who provided the pivotal vote on the Inflation Reduction Act. Manchin had voiced concern that U.S. taxpayers were subsidizing batteries made in China. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Welcome to the sports section of Oxford News this week, and I'm still Terry Stiles, still filling in for Jim Hughes, 
who will be back next week. Oxford boys bowling keeps their undefeated streak strong. In their final match before winter break, the Oxford High School varsity boys and girls bowling teams faced off against the Troy Colts at Collier Lanes. Both teams came out on top with victories, the boys with a 25-5 victory and the girls taking home a perfect 30. The Lady Wildcats rebounded after back-to-back -back losses against Southfield and Lake Orion with senior co-captains Kylie Penzian and Kaya, I think that's Kaya, Kaufman, each securing two points in the games over one 50. The girls' uh, record improves to 3-2. and two. The boys won their first Baker game and lost the second, but remained strong in the following matches, taking home 9 out of 10. Freshman Eli Wright and the had the highest scoring round with a final point total of 212. The boys remain undefeated with a record of 7 wins and 0 losses. Congratulations. After the Detroit Lions controversial loss against the Dallas Cowboys last week, fans are taking matters into their own hands. On Saturday, December 30th, the, game, uh, the game's referee overturned the Lions' potential game-winning two-point conversion near the end of the game. After the play, the game's head referee, Brad Allen, called Lions left tackle Taylor Decker for illegal touching because Allen had marked the wrong player as, in, as eligible. After two more attempts, two-point conversions, the Lions failed to score, ending in a 20-19 loss. Now several digital billboards protesting the game's outcome have appeared around Metro Detroit highways, including I-75. One has two rotating signs saying Becker reported and a display of the Lions uh, current record of 11 and 5 crossed out to 12 and 4. <laughs> the team's record this season has been historic with their win to loss ratio after 10 games making their best start since 1962. The protesting billboard is signed anonymously in the bottom right-hand corner, but expresses the frustrations of many other Lions uh, in a story, and Lions fans in a story that has sparked controversy across the news. That's it for sports. We'll be right back. Bring it. Sorry, I'll, I'll see you later. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and this story is taken from New Scientist. Our ability to perceive rapid changes in visual scenes over time, our speed of sight, varies a surprising amount between people according to the first study to systematically investigate the question. 
This suggests that some people can track fast-moving objects better than others because of their innate superior vision, which may contribute to people's different ability in sports like baseball and cricket, says Clinton Harlem at the Trinity College in Dublin. Our speed of sight is also known as the flicker fusion threshold because of the light is flashing on and off at a frequency above someone's threshold, it appears to them to be shining steadily. It's comparable to how many frames per second our visual system processes, says Carlum. The threshold varies widely in the animal kingdom, being higher in creatures that can move faster, especially if they hunt other speedy animals. For instance, the peregrine uh, falcon, the fastest creature on Earth, thanks to its plummeting hunting dives, has a flicker fusion frequency of about 130 images per second, or 130 hertz. The upper threshold for humans is often taken as a flicker rate of about 60 hertz. To find out how much this ability varies between individuals, Harlem and his colleagues asked 88 people from the university to view a flickering light, the frequency of which could be adjusted. They used three methods, asking the person to turn the frequency up until the light stopped flickering, asking them to turn the frequency down until flickering began, or asking them to say whether the light was flickering above a series of random chosen frequencies. The participants repeated all the tests on three occasions to see if their threshold changed from day to day. Using the last method thought to be the most accurate, the average flicker threshold for the whole group was about 50 hertz, but varied from 34 to 61 hertz. The range is a lot larger than I expected, said team member Kevin Mitchell, also at Trinity, Co Trinity College London, or Dum Dublin, that is. For most things in the world, that probably wouldn't make any difference to the way they're perceived because they're not moving fast enough. But there are some things moving very fast where it might well make a difference. If something were to fly past your eyes very rapidly, but you have a threshold high enough to capture that image, your brain would probably turn it into a blur going in a certain direction, says Harlem. Whereas in someone with a very low threshold, that flying object might not be captured at all. It isn't known what causes people's flicker threshold to vary, but it could involve innate features of the cells at the back of the eye that react to light or the parts of the brain that process vision. There are multiple levels of processing that get an image presented to our conscious perception, says Harlan. I think it's a combination. This is a very nice study because, it completely, because it's completely new, says biologist Simon Portier. He speculates that people may be able to increase their flicker threshold with training, for instance, if they play fast-moving sports such as baseball or squash. Keep it up. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and I'll never see that curveball. Okay. <laughs>
From day one, we have never once seen a bill. It gave us the peace of mind to know that we're there with our son and we're gonna beat cancer together. Now, he is doing really, really well. He's alive because of what St. Jude has done. He's here because of the doctors who came before, their blood, their sweat, their tears, of every day being in that hospital, the knowledge that has been accumulated and shared with everyone else around the world. You know, this is how we get rid of this, how we help kids beat cancer all over. It's the future. When a crisis hits close to home and across the globe, Nonprofits are on the front lines, ready to serve. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. The demand for charitable services has skyrocketed, and nonprofits are rising to meet the needs. Healing, nurturing, rescuing, honoring, protecting, caring, inspiring. The work of philanthropic organizations of all sizes, across all missions, has never been more important. And it's donors and volunteers like you who make all this possible. Thank you. Together, we change the world. The Nonprofit Alliance. In our last story this week, Oxford High School grads strike up the band, while this year's Rose Bowl game brought competition between the University of Michigan and the University of Alabama, four Oxford High School grads united through marching band performances. The first day of the new year was marked by the 110th Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, with the University of Michigan taking home the win 27 to 20. Three Oxford grads, Nicholas uh, Trush, I think that's Troy Tannis, and David Michaels, supported their maize and blue as they performed with the university's marching band. Andrew Hesselton, another Oxford grad, marched with the University of Alabama's Million Dollar Band. The students performed in both the bowl games and the Rose Bowl parade beforehand in a tradition stretching back 135 years. The youngest marchers, Andrew Hesselton and Troy Tannis, are in their sophomore year at college, and the oldest, Nicholas, I think it's Trush, uh, graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in pharmaceutical science in December. Congratulations to all Oxford High School grads who performed in that iconic day. As always, thank you to our news gathering sources. This week's news was gathered from the village of Oxford, Oxford Township Parks and Recs, Downtown DDA, Oxford Community Schools, and the Charter Township of Oxford Facebook page and website. The Oxford Leader, the Village of Oxford.org, the Detroit News, click on Detroit, the Oakland Press, HumbleDesigns.org, Oxford Elementary, Oxford Schools.org, the Detroit Free Press, and Tournament of Roses.com. This week's photo credits go out to photo number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. And they all go out to everybody that took those photos, mostly CJ Carnacchio. OCTV can be viewed on Spectrum Charter Channel 191 and Channel 99 on AT&T UVerse. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, and Roku apps as well. If you have a show idea or would like to volunteer at OCTV, give our office a call at 248-628-9658. A very special thank you to our producer and director, Kyle Snage videographers, news writers, Allison William, uh, Miller, sorry, uh, editor, Marissa Ruska, and Kyle Snage, uh, programmer, Connie Miller, program coordinator, Dan Zweiss, and station manager, Terry Stiles. For everyone here at OCTV, I am Terry Stiles, hoping you have a safe week, and I invite you back next time when we take a look at Oxford News this week.